I'd like to welcome everybody to our March 2024 meeting with Columbia County, Oregon beekeepers. And um, we have a guest tonight. We have Etienne and I, I met him by just watching his videos that he's been posting. And in fact, my talk that I gave last month was talking about winter and talking about insulation and um, how the air moves in the hive. Etienne actually recommended a couple papers that I got from Oregon State University so that I could give that talk. So thank you, Etienne, on including me into those papers. Um, and Etienne, I, I, I like his approach towards beekeeping because he comes from an engineering background. And, um, and so it, it's a kind of a unique mind where you want to know those numbers. <laughs> uh, many of us, me included, uh, you know, I, I want to know the numbers and then they go right outside my head. So it's hard for me to kind of put numbers together. And that's what I really liked about your talks is, um, so if you'd like to kind of take it away and then you can introduce yourself maybe a little bit more. And um, welcome to Columbia County, Oregon. Sounds good. So my name is Etienne. Uh, like you mentioned, I am an engineer, uh, mechanical engineering background. I actually do more engineering with my bees than I do in my work life. Uh, my work life right now is mostly uh, coaching and mentoring for young leadership in, I guess, in industry. So in manufacturing, steel mills, mining, and different things. But uh, I've been keeping bees uh, since a geologist friend at a mine site convinced me, uh, said, hey, we convinced the uh, environmental department to, to buy me some hives and some equipment. Do you want to participate? I had no idea what beekeeping was back then. Uh, so we bought beekeeping for dummies. We taught ourselves. We were in a remote area of Northern Ontario, uh, north of Lake Superior. And basically we went on a journey of beekeeping and that's where it all started about 20 years ago. Uh, I did move to Australia in an even more cold place. And then I stopped for a few years, but then I started back up once I came to the Yukon. So I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, I do have numbers in the uh, in the presentation. Uh, I did share the PDF uh, with Linda, so feel free to do whatever you want with it. It's uh, I share everything, uh, and that way you can actually reference it. But most of the numbers are more for illustrating the direction or the trend or the differences, the magnitudes of difference versus the number itself is not that important. But I'll, I'll refer back to, to, to help you see how big some of these values are. Uh, so I'm a very data-driven beekeeper. Uh, I collect a lot of information. Uh, I don't keep that many hives, so I'll just share my screen so I just follow my presentation so I don't veer off topic too much. Uh, and I'll remove this. Okay. So, like I said, so I keep bees in the Yukon. Uh, it's a nice, pristine environment. Uh, it's the boreal forest. So there are challenges to keeping bees up here. Uh, it's not a forage rich area. So I typically keep about four hives, uh, two, three hives, a nook or two per yard, uh, just to minimize the impact on the environment but also guarantee that at least I get some honey because if I put too many hives then I won't get any honey. Uh, so I'm not gonna do a wintering talk, uh, but there will be numbers because I want to illustrate the impact of how much heat is lost in some colonies uh, during the most stressful time of the season is just the winter's done. The bees have been in their box for the winter. Uh, they're coming out of uh, of winter, they have fewer numbers. They might have been broodering uh, slightly during the colder time of the year. Uh, they're hungry, they're older, and now they're becoming nurse bees. The winter bees are converting to nurse bees. Uh, they're starting to use their fat reserves to, 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 to generate that first uh, generation of bees. 
so now they're trying to maintain that box to a 95 F or 35 Celsius uh, temperature. Uh, some boxes are made out of wood, some boxes are made out of poly or there's insulation. And so what I wanted to show here is this is actual data. Uh, this is a colony, a wooden colony that's uh, trying to brood rear. Uh, and watts in general, so you can imagine a light bulb, so a 30 watt light bulb. So it's equivalent to about three pounds of honey per week uh, heat consumption or heat loss. And this, the temperature outside is like 75, 72F versus the 95F inside. And you can see that they're still losing this much honey or energy just by trying to maintain their brood nest. Uh, the reason I just use polys up here and I don't bother uh, with wooden colonies is one, I wouldn't get any honey. And the other is my bees would stress out and they'd starve out, uh, especially in winter and especially in spring when they start uh, brood rearing up. So having a poly hive, so here the temperature difference is 41 from, it was minus 20 outside. Uh, and you can see that they're only consuming like 0.4 pounds of honey uh, for heat to, to maintain their temperature inside. So you'll see there's those things that I've been crunching over the years just to help me understand what's going on in there. So like I said, this talk will be about spring to spring with an emphasis on nutrition too. So this is just to give you an idea of where I live. I'm up here, uh, Alaska's over here. Uh, there's, these are different beekeepers up in the Yukon. Uh, there are beekeepers in Fairbanks in Dawson City. Uh, I used to live over here, north of uh, Great Slave Lake, Yellowknife, and I started keeping bees up here in northern Ontario. But uh, more moose up here than people. Uh, there's about 40,000 people up here, and I think there's like 60,000 moose. Uh, <laughs> there's not that many hives up here because it is tough. Uh, especially for beginners who don't take the time to learn uh, the ins and outs because uh, most of the data and the knowledge and the books are all about beekeeping in the south and it's taken me a while so I do get decent uh, wintering uh, so usually I get most of my colonies through and then I'll, I'll cover what's been my headache for the last uh, five years. Uh, but I think I've resolved it or I've identified the problem. So like I said, uh, I have three yards. These are just two, uh, but I use my yards for, for different reasons, for making my own queens, introducing new queens, doing my splits. So it allows me to move my colonies around and manage things. Uh, I've got one bee yard in my own property and then uh, two other bee yards in friends' uh, properties and I usually run mutts, uh, carniolan type, like the darker queens seem to do well up here. And that's that. Uh, so typical spring colonies here. Uh, so one piece of advice I give folks is take pictures. Uh, so with the iPhones, different things, it'll help you look at the cells, but it also, It'll help you keep track, keep records. I'm terrible at taking notes, but I take a lot of pictures. And then I create my presentations. I make Facebook posts and different things to my group. And that way, that's how I keep my notes. Uh, but over here, I keep doubles, singles, uh, five frame nooks. Everything's wintered outside. And you can see this five frame nook. Uh, having a five frame nook survive seven months of winter and come out of winter it's wonderful because you'll always have the odd colony that may not have a queen. So then you can just use the nook to, to help uh, fill things in. Just to give you an idea, a queen up here, if I'm gonna buy one from Vancouver, uh, shipped via airmail uh, is like close to 80 bucks Canadian. So it's really expensive. So uh, I tend to replace buy new queens 
But my old queens, if she's still laying, still doing a decent job, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw her in a nook box so she can keep producing brood, producing wax, and then she becomes a backup queen because I only pinch queens that have stopped producing. They, they have health issues, uh, the brood issues, different things. But if the queen is still doing a decent nest, I've kept queens at the five years uh, and still laying decently. But after two years, I usually put them in my retirement uh, nook boxes. And it's just a way of me of trying to stay sustainable and not spend too much money on, uh, on queens. Uh, let's see. Mites, because I like experimenting, I've let a couple of colonies uh, go crazy on mites. So I just let them go to see what would happen. Because uh, folks said, oh, you've got a super long brood break up there. Mites won't be a problem. Well, they're a problem. Uh, so I don't, I just use OEV. They're not as big of a problem as down south. So with a couple of treatments in the spring, usually maintains the number. So if I treat uh, a new nook or a colony once or twice a year, uh, it takes care of the mite issue. If I stop treating a colony, for example, in those experiments, then it takes about uh, two years, three years for those mites to go exponential and then destroy that colony. So I've, uh, I've trialed it twice just to see what would happen. So now I've just bought one of those uh, vaporizers, the quick ones. So it should speed up my, uh, my treatments. And in a nutshell, the reason I show this is to show that these are bees that have been in this box. Uh, last flight, cleansing flight was probably October and they were in the box. So uh, you're able to, once you understand the dynamics of the box, nature, brood rearing, age of bees, uh, I'll talk about my feeding strategy on how to mitigate. It probably won't be an issue for you because you're already getting some early pollen there but it might give you some ideas about uh, some critical areas where you might have some, some nutrition gaps and how if you, uh, so I only get one shot at the season. So if I make a mistake or something happens, usually that colony will struggle. It'll make the winter, but it'll only recover the following season. So it's critical that I don't make mistakes or that I maximize the, uh, the uh, the potential of the colony uh, population wise. So spring spring is where a lot of times we open up our boxes and we have our first look uh, here because it's so damn cold uh, and the the colonies are are basically covered with snow. Uh, there's no point me opening things up yet. Uh, but one thing to note is a lot of the moisture you see in a dead out is actually from that diurnal. It's from the, the day high to the, the, the morning low and that shift, that cold, hot, cold, hot, and that condensation. And because these really are sponges. So every day you'll get condensation events and it builds. So if you don't open that box almost instantly after that colony collapses or dies in winter, it becomes really hard to understand because people say, oh, moisture kill my bees. I'll use a bad word. I'll call BS on most of, uh, of those situations unless they've opened that box really early in the season or as soon as it, it, uh, it passed away or died. But the typical issues for me was nosema. Uh, but what I've discovered now it's nosema and amoeba disease. I'll talk a bit about amoeba disease. Uh, it's more of a problem in places where bees don't really have cleansing flights and the equipment has been tainted. So I had a couple of events where there was high levels of dysentery uh, because of honeydew honey and a really long winter. And what it caused is the bees defecated in the equipment. Uh, they had nosemas and amoeba, and the equipment got tainted. 
And what happens is the following season or if I reuse that equipment, it reinfects the bees and it's a spring, uh, it's a spring disease where it actually comes out. It builds over the winter and then it basically peaks in early spring. Uh, and for example, amoeba, I'll have a colony make it through the winter. It looks fine and I'll have 12, 14 frames of bees. And within a month, that colony's gone. And that's been the problem over the last couple of years. So I'll talk a bit about that. So anyways, root causes, typically what I tell folks uh, in my background is it's our job as beekeepers to get the knowledge that we need to succeed. So if you don't know, then it's find a mentor, ask some questions, hypothesize, then get people to challenge your hypotheses, all those types of things. It's important to build that critical thinking and to look at things as much as possible uh, a lot of times folks lack consistency they keep trying new things and they change too many variables so the key to wintering even summer spring ramp ups all that the key is to be consistent and then you use some of your colonies to try new things but you try to do incremental changes versus really really big changes uh, i'm not sure what your winter survival is there but uh, here a good beekeeper will get most of their colonies through. They'll probably get uh, 75 to 90% of the colonies through. Uh, and a new person might do 50-50 or fail the first couple of years till they actually uh, stop following Southern approaches and follow what works up, up here or in Northern, different parts of Northern Canada. And that starts understanding bee nutrition. Because I'd say be this nutrition. Is actually, one of my goals, Etienne, is that our success rate will increase because I think that we need to be doing a little bit different practices because we have so much moisture. Um, so that's one of my goals is that we will have better survival rate of our hives. Right now, I think last year, our club, the people who reported, had a 60% survival rate. Um, I think or, or it was like, yeah, I think it might have been 60 percent survival, which was a really good year. It's less than that because I forgot. To it was less than that? Well, because I forgot to report and I lost all of my hives. Oh, okay. <laughs> she brought I, I saw her now. Because oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm telling you right now, these bees are really adaptable, but it's finding the right method. And I know there's people in your area, in Oregon, in, uh, in Washington State, the Pacific Northwest that do have success. And it's just finding that formula. And a lot of it has to do with making sure, like I start preparing for winter in May. So, and I'll go through that. So the key is you don't prepare for winter in fall, you prepare for winter in spring. And what you do in spring, what you do in early summer, and the sequence of things is really, really critical. So, and I'll go through my, my thinking process, and hopefully it'll trigger some ideas and some potential approaches. Because I'm telling you right now, uh, the, the moisture principle I'll share after this talk there, the, the one I did at Hive Life this year uh, was on where does moisture come from? And I'll share that presentation with you, Linda, and you can share it with the group. Uh, All right, thank you. No worries. Uh, because just to remember, moisture is honey consumption. Okay, there's uh, two thirds of a cup of water produced for every pound of honey consumed that bees have to manage. Uh, air, even at 32F on the Pacific Northwest, has less water than the bees need to be healthy in winter. Okay, so there's all these values as I, I've calculated and measured in my colonies to say what level of moisture do the bees want. And there's all these numbers that keep popping up. And I was like, hmm, there's something here. So I'll share that presentation with you. And... Uh, we can chat on it uh, later. But anyways, managing your pests, hive setup. And then the big one here is 
uh, weak hives in large volume. Like I said, I winter five frame nooks, singles and doubles up here. And I think that's one of the failures that people do is they don't manage the volume and the volume is related. It will like the bigger the volume, the more surface area there is, the higher the heat loss, the higher the heat loss, the more honey consumption, the more honey consumption, the more water production. So, cause we've got beekeepers in the prairies here uh, that just do singles. I, and it's, it's once you get away from conventional wisdom or what typical people do, you, you start understanding how, uh, th what the drivers are to a lot of these things. So just some basics. Uh, usually I just go through some things. So is it just for the bees? Do you want honey? Uh, are your hive always weak in the spring? So if they do make it through the winter, are they weak colonies in the spring? And how long does it take you to, to ramp them up to, uh, to strength? Uh, do you collect pollen, propolis? Is it for pollinating gardens? Is it for education, extra income? Uh, is your goal to get 100% or 90% winter survival? Uh, do you want to go treatment free? I'm not against it. Uh, I did try to go treatment free initially, uh, but now I've learned that if I treat mites really early in, uh, I guess that colony's life, uh, typically I won't really have to treat after that. So there, there's some things you can do. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever seen this book. Uh, it's actually worth the read. Uh, but what it'll do, it'll help you appreciate, because uh, a lot of my, my inspections now are just by observing the hive from outside, listening, watching the sound, uh, the traffic, what the bees are bringing in, is the landing board wet, is it dry? Uh, and there's all these things that give you clues about what's going on in the hive. So it's a fellow, it was a book written probably 60 years ago in Germany. Uh, it's available online if you Google it at the Hive entrance. Uh, there's a bunch of PDF versions available. It's, I think, uh, Northern Bee Books uh, in the UK sells print, but I think you can get it free online. So if you haven't read it, I'd say it's a really easy read and it's worth reading. And it goes through each season. Uh, most of my inspections are five minutes. Okay, so literally, if I don't have a goal, I'm not going to inspect my colony. I'll just look at it from outside. So, and this is more for beginners, people just starting out. And usually I won't pull more than two to four frames. Uh, I will do a full inspection in early spring where I'll clean up, probably downsize it to a single or clean some frames up. Uh, and then I'll do one uh, probably late July after the honey flow, uh, just to make sure it's, it's all ready for winter. So I'll do two full inspections. Uh, but what I do is these four frames, I'll just get my, uh, my pointer going. Uh, let's see, laser pointer. So the frames, so the first inspection, I'll go from left to right and I'll pull the four frames. I'll get an idea of like the honey, how much honey is in there, then the pollen frames, then the, uh, then the brood frames. And usually I'll use a Sharpie and I'll write it on top of the frame and I'll go left to right. So then say 10 days later, when I do inspect, I'll see my markies, my Sharpie marks on there and I'll go from right to left this time and I'll alternate. So eventually, so every two weeks, I get to see almost the whole box. I usually run nine frames in my 10 frame boxes. And that way, every two weeks, I'll see every frame. I love running singles. It just makes inspection so much easier. So over the last couple of years, uh, I will do doubles uh, for really big production hives to make honey. Uh, but I do make honey on my singles. And my doubles is usually the, the colonies I'll use to do splits just to maintain my numbers. Uh, so what you're doing is location of brood, uh, how many numbers, and you'll see this has to do with the queen assessment too, because I'm always assessing my queens. So where's the brood? How many frames? How many frames of bees? 
Uh, so evidence of eggs, general health, and the location of uh, the stores. One thing I do at every inspection is I tilt it. So I'll take the back of the colony and I'll, I'll give a heft test. And what it does, it gives me an idea of how heavy that thing is. And you do it before you do your inspection. Because what that does is now you can go look inside the colony and then you'll be able to connect how heavy that thing was, the colony was, versus what it looks like inside. And so what it does is after a few years, you'll just give the heft test. You'll look outside, you'll look at your, your, your debris tray if you're using a, a screen bottom board. And most of your inspection is done even before you do your inspection. Okay, so when I first started, I took quite a long time doing inspections. But now, like I said, I'm down to five minutes max uh, per colony. And I have specific goals when I go in there. So I love my debris boards. Uh, so I use screen bottom boards on everything. So poly colonies or poly hives, they all come with uh, screen bottom boards. And what it does is it lets me get an idea of my drop. And most critical for me is uh, because it's cold here all the time. So I can't do mite washes very often. Uh, so what I do is I'll just give it a OEV treatment and then I'll count the mite drop. So this is an example of a colony that I hadn't treated and then I treated and then you could see the massive mite drop. Uh, but typically in a colony that I do manage, there might be five, excuse me, to 15 mites drop after treatment, uh, which is quite good. And, and that's my target. Anything below that, I'm not too worried. Uh, but typically what I'll do is I'll do two treatments, seven days apart to make sure, especially in the spring, that the mites aren't just hiding behind the cappings, especially for that first generation of, of brood. But what it does too, you can look at the debris. So you can see the chalk brood here. You can see different issues, uh, potential issues without even opening in the box. And looking at the colors, uh, the dark uh, cappings versus the white cappings uh, or the white wax, it tells you if the nest is expanding, if they're building wax, you can see where the bees are emerging. Uh, a lot of times in late summer, it's too cold to really inspect here. So I can use my debris board to understand the size of the brood nest to say, okay, when should I do my last OEV treatment? And then what I'll do is I pull this, I'll see that there's some, I'll clean it, I'll check it and then I'll clean it again, and I'll check it again the next day or the next couple of days, and I can see the, the bees emerging from their nest just by the brown cappings on this board. And you can actually, it matches the frames. So literally, once there's hardly any brood cappings on this board, I know I can do my treatment and it'll be more effective and the mites won't be hiding behind the, the cappings. So that's the use of these bottom boards. Uh, I don't use them for ventilation. So the, a lot of the, the principles or the, the, the talk around these screen bottom boards is around ventilation and different things. Uh, for me, I don't even use it for that. Uh, I have my screen bottom boards open in winter. Uh, it's protected, but it's wide open, okay? Because I need it for drainage of that excess moisture generated over the winter because the bees are stuck in that box for seven months. So I need somewhere for that moisture to, to flow out. If I don't do that, there's big blocks of ice in the bottom of my colonies. So it's a way for me to manage my moisture. So this one here was the hardest thing for me to learn is assessing my queens. And here I don't like using the word performance, but literally it is performance. So you probably noticed, I, I'm not, I didn't share too many of the charts yet, but uh, I have sensors, temperature sensors in a lot of my colonies. So I typically add a pollen paddy to my colonies because I've, I've designed my colony so for me to be able to put a pollen paddy in there without disturbing the colony. And what happens is if there's a queen in that box, uh, it will start brood rearing almost instantly within a couple of hours. 
Uh, for example, we're March now. So if we get a warm spell, I'm probably going to start putting pollen patties on my colonies in the next couple of weeks. Uh, even though first pollen is until May or sometime in May and winter will pro we're still going to get minus 20s, minus 15s, minus 30s until sometime in April. Uh, we may get some warm weather here and there, but the first cleansing flight won't be until sometime in April. But I'm confident that I'm going to add pollen patties to my colonies now. And the reason I do that is to trigger brood rearing. One is to have more bees in my boxes come spring, uh, but also to start this process here. Because it's important for me, because my season's so short, it's important for me to understand how well my queen is doing. If I don't do this, these pollen patties this early, then I can't assess the performance of my queen until May. But by me doing this, it means by pretty much, I will know once I put the pollen patty, if there is a queen, because the temperature will go up to 95C, or sorry, 95F or 35C. So that tells me that there's a queen in there and the bees are trying to bring the nest up to brood temperature, uh, which is really good. And then the line stays flat. Then I know the queen and the nest and my colony has a successful queen. And then I'll need to do a visual to see what does the pattern look like? How big is the brood nest and all that? And I can do that during my first assessment. <clears throat> but, but if I add a pollen patty and nothing happens, it tells me that either there's a failing queen or there's a dead queen. Uh, and then in my mind is, okay, this colony, once spring comes, it'll be critical for me to find a new queen, which is impossible, but I'll use that colony to reinforce some of the other colonies because there's no point dragging it out if there's no queen in there. So what I do is typically I'll choose a warm day <clears throat> and I'll do my spring cleanup. So my full inspection and I'm counting the number of B frames from the top. I'm just looking top, I'll tilt it, look underneath, and I'm counting the number of frames. So in a box, I'm looking for at least six frames of bees. Uh, four, that colony will struggle up here. Okay, so this is per box. So hopefully I see the queen, and hopefully if I did have a sensor on there, I'll get an indication that there is a temperature, uh, but I'm looking for eggs and I'm counting frames of bees. So this is my first snapshot. So a couple of weeks later, I'm gonna go back and I'll do a second assessment. So I'm, again, I'm gonna count the number of frames of bees. So I'm hoping it's growing, it's expanding. Uh, I will have a look at the frames of brood. Okay, so if uh, during this first inspection, I had two frames of brood, uh, my goal is during the next inspection, I have three frames of brood or more so that there is some expansion going on, okay? Because if it's staying the same or less, uh, that colony is not gonna succeed. So it's critical that uh, either you replace the queen or you use that colony, the bees itself themselves to go boost another colony. So it took me a really long time to learn this and I've lost colonies because of this, because I, I tried pampering, babying, boosting, taking a really strong colony and, and pulling resources for a weak colony that had a failing queen. And then it just ends up not succeeding. So then I just weakened a strong colony to try to boost up a failing colony. So it's, it's important that you learn when to stop helping weak colonies. And then I'll do a third assessment. So sometimes by the second assessment, I know that it's failing. So I'll just make the call there. Uh, but by the, this next assessment, usually there are queens available. I'll probably, they're probably coming from California. So they go from California to Vancouver and then Vancouver flown up to, to here or imports from Europe. So it's uh, the bees or the queens are or travel stressed, so they, 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 they're typically not the best. 
So if it's steady, so I'm looking for a steady growth, the queen is still good. Uh, if it's the same number or less, chances are you need to requeen or start using the resources of that colony to help other colonies that still have uh, decent queens. And again, like I said, knowing when to quit was the hardest thing for me. Uh, once, like I said, I use pollen patties and lights syrup i've actually gone to 1.5 1.4 water to one sugar uh syrup just to help those bees uh initially uh with uh brood rearing so i only feed once a year i feed in the fall uh and i actually there's plenty of stores left in the spring so i don't really have to feed in the spring for food the only feed I do is to trigger to enhance the uh, the brood rearing. So I found in what I've read that light syrup, and when I say light, even lighter than one to one, uh, helps to promote brood rearing. Uh, in my case, it probably helps with the cleansing flights too, because usually they're water deficient uh, in the spring. So it's important to, to give them some extra so they can build a, a really nice first uh, or two rounds of, of bees. So on the nutrition side, uh, I collect a bit of pollen. So I put pollen collectors on some of my colonies in the, each yard and I collect say for two, three hours. And my goal is to look at how much pollen was collected and then the variety of pollen. So down here, this was one yard. Uh, and you can see it's all fireweed. Uh, and these were taken at exactly the same time. And this was another yard. Uh, so this one here, volume wise, about double this one. And the variety was really nice. So there's some fireweeds. There's some asters in there. Uh, there was, I think, some clovers. Uh, the gray, I forget what the gray was. But these are uh, August type, late July type flowers. Uh, and this is for me when they're building their winter bees. So nutrition for winter bees is critical. Okay, so like I said, understanding when your nectar flows are. So prior to me feeding bee, my bees in March to get really big brood nests by May, I was not able to ever get my honey in June. I didn't even know there was a flow in June and I could never get my bees to swarm. Okay, for me, swarming is lovely. It's awesome because it tells me that that colony is healthy. But the key to swarming is doing something with that swarm before it becomes a swarm and it's managing that swarm. So for me, I don't have an issue with swarming because I do splits and I maintain a decent number of nooks. I use my, my older queens <laughs> and I'll use the, that process of swarm control to actually pull out that older queen. So it's, it's part of my process. But understanding when your nectar flows are is critical uh, and the potential of those uh, nectar flows. Uh, we have a honeydew flow here. Uh, that's really hard to understand. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, I've had the honey analyzed because like I said, I'm a bee geek and I've collected a lot of data. I've taught myself how to do microscopy, pollen analysis, so I did pollen analysis and uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance testing on my honey to, to get the sugar ratios, amino acids, and all that type of stuff. So my honeydew up here, and in general, honeydew is lower in simple sugars, higher in complex sugars, and other stuff that the bees can't digest. Okay, so energy-wise, honeydew honey does not have the same kick or energy as a typical floral honey. So in my case, that one winter where I had dysentery and I had the issue with Nosema and amoeba, my honeydew had 50% glucose fructose versus a typical 70%. Okay, so 75%, so almost 25%, or if you do it on, on terms, so it's almost 40% less energy so it means that the bees would need to consume that much more honey to get the same amount of energy out of that honey to stay warm in winter. Hence the reason their guts really filled up with, uh, with stuff 
So they needed more honey to stay warm. The honey had more things they can digest. And that cycle created a nosema loop. And so then a bunch of bees get nosema and nosema is an energy robbing disease. So then it meant that the bees needed to consume even more honey to stay warm. And it just created a massive mess, a poop fest. Ugh, it was just crazy. Uh, so there's a connection there. So it's important that you, that's my situation, but sometimes those things happen elsewhere. So understanding your cycle is critical. Uh, I had a dog for 17 years. He passed away a couple years ago, wonderful dog. Uh, he made me walk three times a day. Uh, I have an iPhone. Uh, we have all these trails around our place. So I basically learned all the flowers. Uh, I mapped them out with pictures, blooming dates, the ones that had bees on it, the color of pollen when they were on it. And then I mapped it to when the typical nectar flows are. Then I did some collecting my colonies and I used it as a little project but it was a really neat project because it really helped me understand my forage cycles and the, the pollen and nectar flows, which was critical for me to improve my beekeeping. And then I had a few aha moments that helped me understand my nutritional gaps in my colonies and how my pollen patties could actually help uh, fill that, some of those gaps. So there's satellite images, there's all these things that you can do, understanding where your bees go. And basically on Saturdays, you'll take a longer walk. On weekdays, you'll have a shorter walk. Uh, occasionally you'll, you'll do longer, longer walks. So it's important if you love the hobby and you want to succeed, basically you need to understand what's going on around your colonies. So just do that. So like I said, I collect a lot of data. It's this 35 Celsius, 95 F. If it's flat, it tells me these are two brood boxes. Uh, it tells me that the bees, the queen is laying, it's fairly stable. Uh, this is my weather station outside. You can see how the temperature is not that warm. So it's like 15 to 10 degrees, the occasional 20, and then it starts getting cool. And then you can see here early October, or sorry, early August, the queen slows down. I add pollen patties, it starts peaking up again. Uh, but if I added a pollen patty here, this line stays straight. So I've learned over the years now is if I wait for this to happen, then it'll be sporadic queen laying. And then the winter bees aren't that good. But if I start adding pollen patties late July, the last week of July, what it does, it maintains the brood nest. And then what I do is I decide when basically the queen will stop laying. Okay, so for us, first killing frost is early August. Uh, there will be flowers after that, but pretty much it's the end of the season. And so my winter bees are late July in August. So what I've done now is I use pollen patties to extend the season until early September. And then I pull, I stop feeding pollen patties and then this happens over here. So what I've done is I've managed the age of my bees because my winter bees were close to 300 days old, uh, early days. But now by doing this, I get them to 200 days old, uh, which just makes for bigger colonies, healthier colonies uh, coming out of winter. So my strategy is feed pollen patties in sometime in March, early April, uh, before it even gets warm, before first pollen, and then extend the season July, August to fill this dearth so that my winter bees aren't so old. And I've pretty much covered that. Uh, one thing folks do is they feed too late in the season. So if I just go back here. So on the liquid front, uh, once I pull my honey 
I'll start feeding, I'll start trickle feeding uh, late July, early August. And when I say trickle feeding, I'll put like a half gallon of light syrup to start uh, and light syrup being one to one, uh, just to see how quickly they consume that. And then I'll go a gallon of two to one. And then towards the end of August, I'll go and do a, a bulk bulk. So I'll do two, three gallons, maybe was it two gallons? So I buy a 25 pound bag of, of sugar. So 12 bucks up here. Uh, and I need one of those in two to one per colony. So that's the feeding I do for each colony. So my colony is usually around 100 pounds coming out of the, the nectar flow. Uh, that's without me taking any honey in the brood nest. I only take my, my honey supers off the brood nest. I never touch unless there's honey dew in there. So the 25 pounds of sugar syrup, uh, that I add is more to backfill that brood nest as it dwindles and it's to top off the, uh, uh, the honey super. One thing to note. Uh, like I said, I taught myself how to do pollen analysis is the early part of winter, they'll be consuming the sugar syrup honey. Okay, which is pretty much 99% pure sugar, very few things in there they can't digest. So it's pure energy. So it's beautiful fuel for them. Okay, so it's great. And then the for example, in May, because I, I, I analyze my dead bees in front of my colonies. So I know what's in their poo and I know what they're eating. So the bees that I analyze, say in February and March, typically have pollens from June and July in their feces. Okay, so it tells me the honey they're consuming here is actually what was collected during the summer. Okay, which is perfect because now there's protein content in it and there's probably things they can digest, but now the winter's almost done. So it fits in well. So the reason I like feeding sugar syrup is one, it basically, it gives them the feed for the early part of the winter. Uh, it creates thermal mass. And what it does is it gives them a, a nice simple fuel, probably for the coldest time of the winter. Okay, so this one here, one thing I did notice is when I collected my pollens, there's in different ratios, some years it's worse, but the once if say you get a frost and the flowers start dying out uh, and there's still warm weather, sometimes the bees will actually start collecting rust off the roses, off the willows, off the fireweed, and then they'll bring that into the colony. So prior to me doing my pollen patties in the, in August, uh, the bees would bring in pollen that I thought was pollen, but it was really rust. Okay, so rust is not really healthy for the bees. And so it means that your which we call them the uh, winter bees will not be the healthiest winter bees. So those are all the little things I've clued in over the years that have helped me get to that 90% uh, winter survival. So like I mentioned, this is my, my feeding uh, in the spring. I'll do light syrup if I need it. And usually it's just for brood rearing. Uh, and in the summer, I'll do it if the colony is in a dearth, it's really hot. Uh, they're not really brood rearing because it's too hot. It happens up here sometimes. Or if I see snot brood or EFB like things, damaged brood, uh, then I'll start feeding uh, one to one and potentially just throwing on a pollen patty to remove the nutritional stressor. And usually the symptoms go away fairly quick. Uh, in the winter, I've stopped doing candy boards because uh, I know now that uh, honey consumption is a function of heat loss and brood rearing 
especially the spring ramp up and that dwindling of the honey stores uh, is actually a function of heat loss, meaning that a colony that's well insulated uh, will actually not starve. So I've never had a colony starve uh, and I don't see those big massive dwindles or accelerated uh, honey consumption in the spring uh, that folks using solely wooden colonies or people who take the insulation off too quick up here uh, sometimes have starving colonies if it gets cold. One thing on honey and the other good thing about uh, getting really thick honey frames up here is there, it creates a pinch point. Okay, and what that does is heat rises, you got the pinch point, the bees are typically plugging this up, so they're slowing things down, so it means the heat that these bees are producing flows up and gets stored in the honey. And that's where thermal mass is. So a lot of times, especially new bees, will, they may not have fully drawn comb, and sometimes they have frames on the outside here that is just plastic or wax foundation and I tell them pull it up there's no point having these empty frames in a box and I said replace it with a piece of wood or a piece of styrofoam with uh, some type of tape or something so the bees don't chew the styrofoam and I say fill it up your bees are going to be more successful without that open space uh, with filler boards uh, it'll help control and protect it I guess be more efficient heat wise uh, especially in the spring and in the fall. So it, it works both ways. So a weaker colony, like I said, uh, for me, a colony in the spring that is not super strong, I'm going to crunch down into a single. If that single is weak, I'll crunch it down into a five or six frame nook. So I'll, I keep consolidating it into a, a comfortable zone because that ratio of bees to volume is critical regardless of insulated or not insulated and once that colony recovers or the queens start laying and then they start growing then i start expanding the volume again so on diseases like i said mites uh, efb like uh, issues during nutritional stressors and it's understanding when things when these things happen so i bored this from uh, randy oliver but it's understanding these cycles. For me, the Nosema cycle is actually, uh, so yeah, it peaks basically in March and April. Chalk brood, usually if I bring a colony or a queen from say, uh, from Europe or from somewhere else sometimes, uh, non-Canada ones, uh, the chalk brood species is different and those queens or those bees are just not able to manage the chalk brood up here. It becomes a problem. Hence the reason I like sticking with Canadian queens up here because it just seems to manage the, the chalk brood better. Uh, so this is the symptom of amoeba. Okay, so your bees will have, and this is a symptom up here because it's cold outside and the bees will die right in front of the colony. Okay, so this two colonies side by each. Uh, typically this colony will be a really healthy looking colony, lots and lots of bees. You'll see a pile of dead bees out front. Uh, but to me, that's an indication of this colony is in trouble because it'll have high nosema loads. And then I've discovered uh, another disease that bees can have uh, and it's called amoeba disease and if you're interested in an article i wrote one for abj and i can send it to you if you want more info on it uh, but in colder climates it's more of an issue uh, in my i guess in my opinion uh, until i in the early 20s and 50s it was a fairly known uh, disease especially in the UK uh, but it sort of disappeared or people forgot about it but I, I guess it's starting to pop up again so it's just something to look out for 
Uh, and that's the same. It's the symptom between the ratio, high mortality, lots of spores. And then you start looking, dissecting these bees and you start seeing these little cysts in their kidneys. And then you can just see how painful it, it would be to have this disease for a bee. And so the bees, they don't want to die inside, so they come and die outside. And then they just pile up. So if I take these bees and I squish them and analyze their guts or I dissect them, I'm able to identify these diseases now. Uh, on climate, uh, like I said, I love walking, hiking, looking at flowers, discovering new things. So it's, it's part of my passion. So things to know, uh, for example, yes, they'll fly at colder temperatures, uh, but usually at around 50 F, the bees will start foraging and they'll probably be focused on pollen in those colder temperatures because a lot of the nectars are locked in or they're not fluid. They need warmer temperatures to, to, to melt or be liquid so the bees can access them. So typically around 16 to 30, 61 F to 85 F is where the nectars start freeing up. And so what I've done is you can chart your weather to these temperatures to give you an idea of what the flows look like. I don't know if I put it in this presentation, but it was just to give you ideas of the different temperatures. So if temperatures are below say 50, uh, in non-insulated colonies, the bees will start clustering. Uh, in insulated colonies, for me, it's around minus 15 uh, Celsius, where the bees will actually start clustering. So there's, they're way more comfortable and less stressed at colder temperatures. So if it's raining all the time, then chances are they can't get pollen or nectar. So it's, it's important to you to understand how many days your bees can go without uh, foraging uh, before they start going nutrition uh, deficient. Uh, if there's a big healthy brood nest in there, how many days can your bees go without proper nutrition? Hence the reason it's important for you to understand those thresholds. And I'm not advocating using pollen patties, but it's really important for you to understand this if you want to succeed. Because I was gonna say, the reason I can get 90% the reason that I have boxes full of bees after seven, eight months of winter is I've learned to manage this and these winter things. So I did, uh, cause I was looking for a town in, uh, was it uh, Columbia County? And I found this, uh, was it Clax County? Yeah. So, so I just picked one that was in your general area just to compare climates. Okay, so you could see how this is you, like you mentioned, there's starting to be some growing degree days now. Because uh, you said some of the undercrops in the forest is starting to bloom. So your peak, your spring is starting hopefully soon for you and it, it'll go. Uh, mine won't be till sometime in May. Uh, that's when first pollen is. And I use Haynes Junction. I'm outside a white horse, but the microclimate here where I'm at is closer to Haynes Junction than uh, a white horse. So you can just, it compares my short season to your longer season. And then over here, it just compares the climate. So I've, this is my reality, and this is what I've had to adapt to. And then this is your reality. And this, you need to understand what goes on in this bar here and during these key periods and so it's three months of winter three to four months so it's what do you need to do are there cleansing flights in there is it wet is it dry uh, and, and all those types of things and i'm telling you right now moisture is manageable and it's just understanding the uh where that moisture is coming from and I'm telling you right now, most of that moisture is not coming from outside the hive. It's actually coming from metabolic water. And the key is to understand that and how to better manage that. And understanding too, that the bees need water to be healthy in winter. If they are too dry, they'll actually struggle also. And hence the reason I love bees because they give us really difficult problems to try to resolve. <laughs> 
So this is just an example of, I was doing a talk Abbotsford, so Southern BC, and this was me comparing a wooden colony to a poly colony. And this was over the year. And this is, it's called degree hours. So it's similar to growing degree days, but it's, it's energy unit. So it's like heating degree days or degree hours. And you can see how this red area is energy required to maintain that brood nest. Okay, so throughout the whole season versus me in my location, this would be my profile of how much energy is used for heating that colony versus the bees just being okay. Okay, and this red is moisture. Okay, because if you remember, every pound of honey, you have two thirds of a cup in there of water you need to manage or two thirds of a pound of water. So it's, it's quite a bit of moisture. So I'm not saying insulate, but I'm saying understand it's key that you start understanding this. Uh, some folks will use like quilt boards and different things, but uh, like I'll show you on the next slide, even top insulation only and how you manage your ventilation or things you can do to help uh, reduce the moisture in your colony. And this is just an example. This was a wooden colony. Uh, somebody gave me their, their data that was set up similar to mine with nine to 10 sensors. And I was able to, to just model it. And you see this gray line is the average temperature inside the box. And as before it brood reads, the bees are consuming about a pound of honey a week. Uh, but once the colony tries to ramp up, uh, it triples to quadruples the amount of honey they need to maintain their temperature. And this is just heat loss, okay? And it just follows this metabolic curve. And so as the bees want to brood rear, uh, basically it just means they need more metabolic energy to produce enough energy to maintain that brood nest. Okay, so it's just, it's that, that cycle that I've come to understand now and the way I manage my moisture now is by pretty much reducing this to even less than a pound. Okay, so my colonies say I'll consume like a single, will consume about 30 pounds of honey in seven months and I don't have to feed in the spring. And a double will consume maybe 50 pounds. And a five frame nook will consume about 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. So you can see how that's how I manage my moisture is by managing this situation. I, I use some ventilation, but I use very constrained ventilation uh, because too much upper ventilation will, will push out too much of the heat. So there's a way you can manage your top ventilation via the size of your lower ventilation and there's a balance between both and like i said there's tons of interesting information in bees hence the reason i do more engineering in my bees than i do in real life it's more fun <laughs> uh, and this is just to show you an example of for example for me to get lots of top insulation is i use a medium or deep box and I fill it with sheets of styrofoam. Okay, so you know, I cut out the two inch styrofoam and I stuff it inside my medium boxes. And this is a poly box. So then this upper box here, this is R40. So then I get very minimal loss, heat loss in the top of my boxes. And then over here in the bottom, I'll have a little tray where I just pop these sheets out really quick and I could throw my pollen patty right here and it's super warm. And sometimes I can even throw a baggy feeder in there and it's minus 20 outside. Uh, and it really doesn't matter because the inside temperature of my box here is warm. So the bees, there's no harm. And I just use a, probably a three, four inch uh, bottom entrance with an open screen bottom board. And the open screen bottom board is protected so that the wind can't blow directly in there. So it's like a crawl space. So there's no danger of cold wind blowing up into the bees. 
So I do the same for my doubles. I'll put a mega box R30 to 40 on top, R30 to 40 on top, and I'll use an empty nook box, the same on top. And so the bees always have tons of upper uh, heat protection. So all the heat collects up here, it pushes it down. And the, if there's any condensation, it happens lower in the box. And hence it flows out of the screen bottom board into my crawl space. And so there's no danger for that moisture to fall on the bees. Uh, there was, because BC has been getting, British Columbia has been getting a lot of these heat waves. Uh, and where it gets up to the like 104, all these things like in the 40 Celsius. The last couple of years, towns have burned down, uh, no water, no nothing. Uh, so there's been, there's been research now that a single sheet of styrofoam, like a one inch, even a two inch piece of styrofoam in your inner cover will actually help one, it reduces uh, the heat load on that colony. So the, the, the bees are less prone to stress. The queen is healthier. Uh, the other thing is it reduces the requirement for evaporative cooling or bearding. So it means the bees can forage on nectar instead of trying to forage on water uh, because there's less cooling required. And in your shoulder season, what it does, it means that because heat rises, and 15 to 25 percent of the heat is lost through the top so it means by just having two inches year round uh, one you're helping in the summer and the other one is you're helping in spring and winter by reducing how much heat flows out of that top and less heat loss just means less moisture and i'm not saying don't top ventilate but just don't go too hog wild or too crazy. Just keep it to a maximum an inch or three quarter inch diameter equivalent uh, with a reasonably like a two inch bottom entrance. And that should be, that should give you a decent uh, flow of air. Uh, and if you do throw insulation on there, that's, it will improve your moisture uh, situation because it means your bees will consume less honey and it means that it'll have less water to manage. And so I am working with an Australian outfit, but when I lived in Australia, folks insulated the colonies in summer there for the opposite reason. So for, they were getting 40, like high hundreds or mid hundred, like 100, 110 summers. Uh, I'm getting minus 40 winters, so which is the opposite, opposite end. So we do the same thing for the opposite reason, for the same reason. <laughs> if that makes sense. It does. And just to finish off the presentation. So like I said, a lot of people are scared of singles. But the key with singles is to understand how the, the process works. So I just put you a little snapshot of how I do things. <clears throat> So usually coming out of winter, I'll downsize that colony if it was a double to a single. Uh, if it was a single, uh, it just stays a single or goes into a five frame nook if it's, if it's not big enough. But what I do is I'll throw on some pollen patty, some light syrup to get that colony to really ramp up. Then in late May, early June, I'm gonna add my honey soup. I'm not gonna use an excluder. So I'm going to give my queen free access to my honey soup. Okay, so this is swarm management. So I need to give her space or else I need to pull resources out. So I'm going to give her space. So she'll probably lay, uh, I don't know, maybe two, three frames of brood in my honey super. But I've done this in May, late May, before the honey flow. Remember, I don't have to feed. I'll do a light feeding here, but once the light feed is done, I'm going to throw my honey super. There's plenty of feed left. She's going to go up there. I'm going to give her the space for about 10 days, and then I'm going to chase her down. So then the next two inspections or one inspection later, 10 days later, uh, I'll, she'll have a few frames laid out. I'm going to take her, put them in the bottom box or her in the bottom box. I'll put my excluder. 
and my swarm issue should be done. If it was a mega hive, I'm going to pull a nook off of it. Okay, I may take two frames out of that one, two frames out of that one, and create a nook and retire one of my older queens. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's what I do. Uh, and then that's for the first nectar flow. So by mid mid June, uh, early June, the the nectar's coming in. Uh, so by the mid June, the all this brood is laid out or hatched out uh, mostly. And so by the end of July or early July, basically I've got a box full of honey, which is good. So I'll pull that, or I'll leave it on and then just add a second super to, to hit the late uh, July honey. So the, the July flow. And then what I'll do is pull the honey in August. Once the first frost hits, uh, which is usually the first week of August. In the meantime, adding pollen patties when honey supers are on does not do anything bad or good. So it's just food. So usually late summer, I'm going to add my, my, my first pollen patty here. And that's just to make sure that the nest stays stable. The queen doesn't stop laying. And then by early, early September, I stop feeding pollen patties. Uh, my feeding is pretty much done, uh, liquid feed. And then so it's, uh, it's time to put this colony to bed. And then I'll probably do the top insulation early uh, before I wrap them. And then by October, I just stick the colonies together, use a bubble foil wrap to, to make them share a shell. And that's pretty much what my winter prep is. Uh, this thing here, in late spring, I do my spring cleanup. I do my queen assessment. I make sure they have enough honey. Uh, it's not a, a for sure science, uh, so it's important that I just make sure they have enough honey. Early June, uh, there is some some frames that get filled out. If I'm using a double, uh, any honey frames that get produced in the top box, I'm going to move to the bottom box. I'm going to do that in early June. Most people do that September or as winter prep, but I start my winter prep, like I said, in spring. So as soon as early June, I start moving my honey to my bottom box. And the reason I do that is the bees tend to do better at honey storage in the top box because it's warmer up there. The wax is more malleable. Same with the brood nest. So what it does, it, it just ensures that by fall, this bottom box in a double is pretty much all honey frames. And then I just have to backfill this top box in uh, late August to sept early September with that 25 pound bag of, of honey or liquid sugar syrup, if that makes sense. So my key is I do this as I go so I don't have to over manipulate later in the season. So late July, I'll do a root check. I'll check the nest size. This is a full inspection, store levels, add pollen patties. Uh, weekly, it's those five minute inspections, uh, OAV. So I did get one of those Insta vapes this year when I was at, at Hive Life. So it should speed things up. I have a really busy work schedule, but at least with this thing now, I, I won't fall behind in my treatments. So early May, I'll do some treatments, do my counts, and then I'll do the same thing in August. And that should manage my mites. Uh, late May, early June is when I do my splits. Uh, so I tend to buy, because like I said, I have four to 12 colonies. So I'll buy four to 12 new queens almost every year. And the goal is to, to manage, or actually 60% of that. So I'll buy, say, two to eight queens every year. And then I'll restock those other colonies, do my splits. And then that way I can maintain my numbers and everything's good. I do use Hive, li Hive Alive sometimes. And if it's colonies that had no CMO issues or the amoeba issues, it, it seems to do something. Uh, and I've had it for a while and I use their, 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 uh, their fondant patties sometimes on some colonies. 
but the one thing I did notice is it does seem to keep them brood rearing in September. So hence one reason I don't like using fondant is it tends for me up here to keep the queen laying, uh, especially the ones that have other things in it. So I do use Hive Alive fondant, but I'll use it in the spring as a feed supplement to help with that first cycle and to help them cleanse and work their, their guts. And then early September, like I said, uh, I'll do two to one, uh, eight liters, so two gallons, and that's the final feed. So I don't have to do much more than that. So hopefully it wasn't too long, but uh, that's the presentation. I don't know if you could hear Jim back here. He goes, wow, he's smart. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you know, um, it, it was beautiful showing your your short season in Klatsk and I, and it just made me think, you know, I need to to just be content with what with what we have, because you know we we have two nectar flows. We have one that's coming up in April, and that's the maple tree. And every once in a while, probably once every six years, we get. Um, a maple flow that our that our bees will actually make honey from. Otherwise, it just rains throughout the whole time because yep. we're kind of rainforest here. And um, and then we have blackberry, and that's in June, and that is our our only nectar flow. Everything else is just piddling. It won't make a honey. It, rarely can you get a. Maybe you'll get a frame of Queen Anne's lace or a frame of chicory. Maybe you know. So I've, I've often, I, I want to complain in the back of my mind about how, oh, woe is us that we don't have much. And, um, but I no longer will do that. So thank you, Etienne, for putting me in my place. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think many of the things that you do are things that we can do too. You know, like we don't have to worry about ice. We might have an ice storm that lasts a week, you know, on the outset. That's nothing to worry about. But I think many of the other things are, um, you know, we may not have to do in the constrained time as you, but um, it would be very useful. And Jim has volunteered that he's going to start taking those walks with his dog, Hula, and they are <laughs> going to make up that plant phenology and, uh, for us. Cool. So, um, um one of the what one of the questions I have, so I just went out today. Now our bees can take winter cleansing flights. So you know it um, probably at least every three weeks they can take a flight throughout our whole winter. Um, but today I went out and I had two colonies that you could tell had dysentery. And actually, this is a problem that I have only faced one other year. So I've never come up with a plan. Um, it sounds like you would suggest something like Hive Alive, put some, um, something in like that. What, what do you suggest that I do? I'd say the, it's understanding is the dysentery because of excess moisture in the colony, uh, the water balance, is it because of their diet? Uh, is it, and, and the reason I, I always ask questions, because you need to understand that before you really do anything, because otherwise you don't know if what you did actually made a difference. Mm -hmm. So if this is where, for example, like bee clubs, uh, high schools. So I taught a high school kid here how to do pollen analysis. Uh, and he won nationals or he came in fourth in nationals at the science fair. Uh, but I've been looking at my high schools here to squish bees to learn about nosema. And to, 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 like I said, I'll give you a free talk and I'll teach the kids how to use their microscopes. I'll give you bee samples. You can do this. You can trend things. But the reason I say that is 
uh, take 10 bees, find somebody with a microscope, because you're at a university there, see if there's any students. Yeah, we, we have one right here at the extension office because we're, yeah. we're actually in the extension office. So we have microscopes here. I think Steve Gomes, who's with us here, who says absolutely outstanding presentation. Thank you. Uh, he actually has a microscope. Um, so Steve, maybe we can get you out here and, and we can. Oh, we got a lab tech back here. Okay, we're, we're going to work on my bees here next week. Okay. Because what I do, it's you want to understand, because this tree is in their gut. So you want to have a look at their gut. So you want to collect bees before they poop out and just put them in the freezer and, and then squish the bees. And the more you do this, the more it'll start telling you a picture. So for example, when I look at dead bees in front, I'll see nosema, I'll see amoeba, I'll see the disease load. And, and then sometimes I'll see gut full of rust spores and fungal spores and then i'll say oh this colony here was actually at a friend's house so i didn't do the pollen patties in the spring i brought it home for winter and they have dysentery and all this issue but their guts are full of rust spores and so either because they collected it or there was too much honeydew in the box okay so so it's okay to collect the newly dead bees to do yes. this okay yeah, and that's that's usually what I do. You know, I'm and you're saying where you have the pollen patty at a certain time of year, like in the fall. Now, if if you're observing your hive and you can see that they're still very active and you can see them bringing pollen in, should you wait until that stops? We're, I mean, we're a whole different climate, much longer pollen season, and I'm pretty rural to where. I've got big fields of dandelions and stuff like that. So they're actually bringing, you know, they're bringing the pollen in and you can observe it, you know, by just watching your eye. So you you really don't need a pollen patty until that slows down or, or it starts raining. Or, oh, and I guess it's the, when I do my checks, I, I, I love it when the colony is pollen bound and I can store pollen frames. But the the, the danger is, let's just say they have one frame of pollen on this side one frame of pollen on the other side and then it rains for a week yeah so and then they run out so it's understanding their consumption rate versus and again it's it's sciencey but it's if you've got a box if you got eight frames like the thing with polys is you get really big brood nests especially early in the season and that brood nest will go through pollen like crazy so in my early days, I just went with natural pollen, but then we'd get cold again for another week. And then the pollen stops and, and then the brood nest just, she just stops laying. And the reason I know that is now I have like, occasionally I'll do experiments and I'll have temperature sensors in there and I'll see nice and stable. There's a weather event or nature, like a weather event being frost or it gets cold again, depending which side of the season it is. And then you, you see the queen slow down and then it just does that. And then for me, like you said, you saw how long my season is. If I make a mess up, my season's done. Yeah. So for me, I know where these spots are and it, it's so easy here. It's actually probably easier for me to keep bees up here than for you because my season's so condensed and it's a lot easier for me to understand yeah. what's going on in that four months than you over your eight months. We can like in early February, you know, we get a nice weather, can even get up high 50s, 60s. We refer to it as a false spring. Mm. And that can just be deadly on the bees because then you get two, three weeks of 40 degree highs with, you know, inches of rain. You know? See this, so this is where, and again, I don't like saying insulate or use polys. But this is where, for me, those are that's not a problem. Like I'll put pollen patties, like I said, in the next couple of weeks, and I will get a minus forty, and we will get a week or two of really really cold. But I'm not worried about it because, like, like I've done the math now, I understand how that heat works, 
And I know the bees with minimal energy are able to maintain that temperature in there. But Theo for Broodminder, he gave me data from down in the, I think he's in Virginia. And the data he gave me, the temperature went up to the brood nest temperature, and then it got cold for him. So minus five Celsius. And then the bees stressed out and you can see they collapsed. They couldn't maintain the nest. So they went back down to that 20 or 70 F and then it got a bit warmer and then the bees tried to maintain the box again at that 95 F and then got cold again and then it dropped. And then you can see the bees are going through the stress cycle and then eventually the bees were able to maintain that brood nest and then the colony took off. So for me, that's a typical spring. Uh, like in June, like we have frost year round, uh, depending. I use row covers in the garden to protect against frost. So the, the challenge is, one is where insulation does help is in the spring. It eliminates those headaches. So we've got people who use wooden colonies up here who've decided just to keep their winter shells on year round uh, because they were removing them in June. It just became a hassle and they found they get more honey, 20, 30% more honey by just leaving it on. So what that tells me is that 20%, 30% of honey that they're getting extra is what the bees are actually using to stay warm without the insulation. And if I crunch the numbers, that's what it, it shows. So yeah. it's, and this, this is where I'm just, just to finish the thought, a lot of times just that top insulation is plenty. And, and using a cork in your top end, once it brood reads and that temperature is at that 95 F, the air can hold a lot more moisture before it would condense out. So what I recommend to folks who use a lot of upper ventilation is once your bees start brood rearing in, the, in early spring, plug that top entrance. Make sure you have top insulation and make sure you've got a decent lower entrance, like a decent being three, four inches. And what that does is now you've just reduced your heat loss by say 10 watts uh, an hour and which is about a pound of honey a week and a pound of honey a week is how much water and you can see how the math works so and it's understanding that cycle once those bees are brood rearing you want to protect that nest from those events and that's what we don't do and i am thinking that at our bees and I and I want a couple of us to try next year to use more insulation than what we've been doing. So pretty much everyone in our club now is using an upper insulation. We're using like inch and a half builder's foam, and um, and I'm thinking that we might actually do better have the bees under less stress of that up and down temperature um, in the late in our late winter early spring by actually insulating at least the top box you know because you most of us have ours in in, in double deeps yep and um and i'm thinking that maybe that might help them just be more comfortable use less energy so they can keep that brood nest going and we'll have fewer spring losses and i'd say do half and half and if you're using like shims or really lots of upper ventilation it's consider go go with half of what you're doing if it makes sense because uh, literally what I'm trying to let folks know is moisture does not come from outside it's generated inside it's metabolic water and it's managing that it's a balance of ventilation and it's a balance of heat loss and it's finding that that perfect balance for your location uh, if you have more clouds than sun, then the solar radiation is a non-issue for you. Uh, like for myself, I, my colonies are wrapped with bubble foil wrap right now. And I've got a piece of plywood leaning in the front. 
but in about two weeks, I'm going to take that piece of plywood off and I'm going to take the bubble foil off because now our days are getting longer. The sun is stronger and now there's value in it. Uh, but for most of the winter, I want no solar effect because again, it creates fluctuation. Fluctuation is condensation uh, because every time it peaks, it goes down, it creates little micro condensation events. And those are the things that accumulate over time. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Anything in there? Except it's not louder. I think my greenhouse, I have an elevation, and in the sun here is just just blasts in the evening straight into it. And I can't get the, my, my greenhouse goes from being at like 40 to 105. <laughs> you know, get the paddock kicks off. Yeah. I, yeah. I have it's a geodesic dome. So oh, yeah, like it's yeah, yeah. yeah. That's not the best. Yeah. I have I have a question on a different subject here. Okay. okay. Let's see if you can hear. Okay, go can ahead, Elizabeth. Yep. Okay. So my friend and I live in class and I she lives, but she, but I live up on a up on a hill and she lives down on the dike, which is just down by a big river and she, there's a canal with water every year. So when she had her bees all summer, there was just enormous amount of nectar. She got so much more honey than me, like enormous amounts of honey. But then, you know, in our area, we have a dirt. After the blackberries bloom, there's basically nothing else for the rest of the year. But she, she kept getting honey. She just kept getting honey straight on through, lots of honey. And I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And I figured maybe there was purple loose tripe in the canal, like maybe it was that. But since you were talking, she's got plantations of poplars all around her that they grow for pulp. So he, so acres and acres and acres and acres of poplar trees. I wonder if she was getting honeydew honey. And her hives all crashed like spectacularly in December. So is there a way to, I mean, I know that like to know if it was no thema, you smash them up and pet them and that, it's too late for that. But is there, how is there, how can you tell if you're getting honeydew honey versus nectar honey? Is there a way to tell? The color. It's more molasses-like. Exactly like, Molasses-like, it tastes woody. Uh, yeah. it, it's great peanut butter and, and honeydew honey is great on toast. Cause it's, it's awesome. It's so it's, it's really good honey. And, mm -hmm. but so if it's dark and molasses, like it doesn't really crystallize over the years, I'd say it's probably honeydew and you can smell it. Uh, what does it, it smell like? It's woody. It's, it's, it's an interesting smell. It, it's, it tastes like honey, but it's not honey. It's it's, and I think the smell might vary by what sap that exactly. insect is eating. Okay. Um, but it's invariably yeah. dark. So, you know, most of our honeys would have crystallized over the winter. So, if you have it indoors, or is it still in the frames? Uh, most of it's been in the freezer. Well, even in the freezer, see if it's crystallized. And if it has not crystallized, then probably, it's according to Etienne, it's probably it's, honey. It's honey, how do I not feed it to the bees? Do I take it out at the end of the year? Usually that's what I do. So if you, if it is honeydew, especially with the moisture you have and the ground moisture you have where you are, I'd say <laughs> it's, because there's a few places, like, People will actually chase it. Uh, and I'm telling you the properties of that honey is usually quite interesting. Uh, and there's a market for it because yeah. it's, it, it's forest honey, it's different honey. Uh, and I'm not sure if there's anybody at the University of Oregon there, but uh, who could help you tell you exactly what it is, but it, it might be a really interesting uh, honey that, uh, you could actually sell at a premium. So since she froze the frames, we could still extract that, right? Yeah, just thaw it out. And I'd say frozen honey becomes stable. 
more stable cold. So you would have to leave it on the counter. I'd say extract it. And if it's, uh, I don't have a picture handy, but if you, if it's like molasses, if it's dark yeah. and then you pour it and it pours like, like molasses type stuff, then it's, it's likely honeydew. And if you taste it and it's got like a woody, strange flair, like almost smoky, then I'd say there's a good chance it's honeydew. So going forward, should we, um, should, so, okay. So we're going to have to, obviously it's going to happen probably every year. And you don't want to be to die every year from eating that. So we pull that out towards the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then feed sugar water. Yeah. Save some blackberry. Yeah, that's true. You could we could maybe freeze some blackberry honey drink and then sweat swap them out. Because because she was getting honey basically to a frost. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, so it's like there wasn't time to feed sugar water in between. So I got like two gallons of honey per hive over the summer. First year babies. And yep. then fifty pounds after that. Wow. Well, I will buy a, a port off of you if you have it. <laughs> when does the cotton wood blue? Well, well, remember. You mean the it's cotton wood water? Pretty much. Yeah. Right? Okay. But this is honeydew, so it's from like aphids and other insects will eat the scent of the poplar. And then grease the sugar, and then the bees, and the bees okay. collect the that. Okay. Yeah, that's the honeydew. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I wasn't sure what honeydew was. No, now, yeah. now yeah. Okay. My oh. understanding is that there's two kinds of honeydew, and 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 then we'll get to Steve next. You know, one kind is, you know, the bees actually will directly eat some of the saps off the trees. Yeah. And the second type of type of honeydew, which is the more common, is that they'll eat that excrement of the aphids that yeah. eat the sap. Which is pretty much the same thing. For example, on aspen, a lot of times there's wasps and yellow jackets and stuff, uh, and it's dripping off. So it's the aphids up above chewing through the, I guess, tapping into the tree and the leaves. And then it spills out, their poo spills out, and their poo is almost pure sugar. And that's what the wasps and the bees uh, collect. So well, honey, think... honeydew is the stuff coming off the, uh, I'm just going to share. We'll get to you next, Steve. Just a second. Yep. I'll just show you a picture. I think I have, a, yeah. So like I said, I did a lot of, of uh, bee geeking. So I collected like 60 different honeys, 40 honeys from the Yukon and you can see like these ones here, those are honeydews. Uh, and these are my honeys over the years. So this first one was from leafy trees. So willow, probably uh, rose and poplar. And as they go this way, then they became spruce honeydews. Uh, and then sometimes my honey looks like this, it's blossom. So it's a mix of everything. And Sometimes it's a mix of fireweed and honeydew, so it'll just be mixes of colors. But literally, uh, you're looking for darker honeys. And usually, like buckwheat, there's always the exceptions to the rule. Uh, hence the reason then you'll go by taste and, and or you send it to the lab or somebody at the, somebody at a, facility. 
Yeah, we have a honeybee lab. I don't know if they, I, I've never heard that they do honey studies, but I'll ask them. Yeah, good. So other question? I'll just stop sharing. Okay, Steve, you got a question. <clears throat> Oh, I got a lot now. You left me on hook too long. <laughs> um, first of all, um, at the end, I, I have read a lot of what you've written. We have a local um, member of the Portland Urban Beekeepers, Ryan McDeno. He's uh, kind of taken the ball and run with it when it comes to your, your uh, analysis of temperature and moisture. Um, what seems to work really well for us in this environment is not necessarily polyhives because we don't have that extreme in most locations, although those might be really good for upper elevations that stay colder. But it's just uh, eliminating the top entrance completely and insulating that that cover and leaving it on year round. Um, we we did we had a couple real hot days where we had very low humidity, like ten to fifteen percent, real high temperatures in the summer, and the colonies that had that that top insulation and that the woodenware was sealed up tight, uh, weathered those those extremes, both at the cold and at the hot end really well. And the consumption, um, just the amount of stores that they use year round on the average went down significantly. So um, thank you for being the bee nerd that you are and, and uh, uh, posting all that data and sharing it. I think it's, it's um, it gives us a, a pause to think about how we're doing what we're doing and you know wh wh when we're managing colonies and what the effect is um and there's been a lot of common knowledge that has um not been tested and and i, I like citizen scientists that test things and and uh come up with some good i have a question about the pollen yeah you 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 study the nectar and the honey and the consumption of the bees you know, through their cycle and, and they, and it's, it's like something popped into my mind. One of the last things you do in your beekeeping calendars as you approach winter is give them that final feed and they're storing that sucrose base um, uh, syrup and, and it's backfilled probably as close to the root nest as anything else is. Yep. So my, my, my question is this, is do you think that they're using that first because of proximity or possibly that they know that there's a difference in the in the quality of the feed and they're selecting that first and saving the the other stuff for later in the seasons. My my dream would be the the latter, but the, uh -huh. the, the probability <clears throat> is proximity. And the yeah. other thing to remember, if you actually look at I've got old frames. You can see the, the, the cap pollen or the liquid pollen and the honey and the layers in the cell yeah. as they backfill. Yeah. So it's, it's proximity. It's what's exposed. They'll right. go from the top down if they could tap from the bottom. But it actually makes, I won't say it makes sense, uh, but knowing where bees come from and the last nectar flows and what they get access to, uh, so I might have they evolved. I'm not sure, but I think the the main reason why most Canadians and in the prairies and our like the commercials and folks use sugar syrup honey is for gut health. Yes, yeah, because it, they it, oh, well, like Ian Ian confines his bees, and if if you're putting food that's laced with impurities in there, those bees are going to have to get rid of that, and the longer they can avoid having to take a cleansing flight and, and maintain gut health the better. So you clean us, you give them the cleanest speed that you could possibly can to help them get through that long period of confinement. And the example that was just given around the honeydew. Uh, so mm -hmm. one thing I do do is I use my five frame nooks and my retired queens to build, a lot of times I'll keep feeding those. So they build wax and they draw honey frames. Mm -hmm. And then I get these big monster frames full of honey sugar syrup, honey. Yep. And then if I ever have to backfill a colony, <clears throat> then I've got my frames already. Yeah, you're, you're using uh, 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 Michael Palmer's brood factory. Pretty much. Uh, functionality. It works for more those, those narrow uh, boxes. There's something about the dimensions of those when you start going vertical with them. The bees just go nuts and, and really... Uh, build up brood and frames. 
it's, it's, it's like you perfect. mentioned, it's the chimney yeah. effect. It means that yeah. whole box is warm. And then yeah. for me, it's poly. So it's literally, I, I sometimes get eight, nine frames of brood in one box. Ah, I could imagine. Right, right across. Yeah. And I um, love those because it's wonderful. Yeah. So, so in your five frame mutes, now you say all your boxes are poly. Uh, now oh. they are, yeah. They are? How, where do you get your five frame poly nuke boxes? Or so, do you build those? I do build some and uh, let's see, I get, they're the licensed ones. They're six framers. Oh, okay. Okay. I know and, what you're speaking of. And usually I use a, like a, a one by 10 pine board is the same width as a frame, uh, like a right. standard frame. So what I do a lot of times is I'll notch it, I'll cut them to a frame size and then I'll notch the ear. So then I use it to replace, because the challenge with polys is it doesn't absorb moisture. So what I've done is I'm trying to get wooden colonies inside a poly box. So ah, you're lining, I'm lining line, them. I'm using the, that pine board uh, on the inside. Hence the reason I go nine frames or eight frames in most of my boxes is I put those pine boards on the outside. And what it does is it gives it, it absorbs when there's extra mm -hmm. and it, it releases when there's less. So it actually helps with that. It's almost it like a, a moisture buffer. Both ways. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a, like a, um, a reservoir that can eat, absorb or release moisture. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then the final question was pollen. Um, beings that you're strategically feeding pollen, I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of very strategic husbandry to achieve, to, to keep your colony building and, and, and you know, like shutting the queen down at a specific time of year and then, and then, then building up that, that uh, increase that takes place in the spring and maintaining that until a specific time and you've mapped those times out. The pollen uh, and versus the substitutes, um, I've, I'm imagining that you have probably done research into the balance of the proteins and the nutrients that are available in, in, in the substitute products that you're using. Um, I've always wondered when the bees are presented with a substitute like prior to the production of the diatomaceous bees, the winter bees, are they, go, are they going to select or, or you, you, have you seen them utilize the substitutes in lieu of the, the natural pollen that they've stored to produce those winter bees? Because those, to me, those are the critical bees. If those bees aren't healthy and don't have the right reserves in their bodies come springtime, uh, brood rearing is going to be inhibited to some degree, and the, the vitality of pollen can be impacted. So, what's your your kind of take on all of that? So, so because I've read and I've talked to Dr. Ellis, and because he has that study out, and he keeps pushing it about pollen patties and having zero effect, and then he mm -hmm. quotes studies in uh, around University of Guelph and all these places, but these places have abundant pollen. Mm -hmm. okay? And they have tons of pollen. So one is the pollen patties that I use. I use global patties uh, and they're typically 15% real pollen. Ah. Uh, I don't use any of the fakes. Like, yes, there's a fake component on it, but I don't use anything that doesn't have real pollen in it. Okay. okay so that's my number one rule. Uh, my ideal, I was using the 55% uh, real pollen patties. And the guy at Global I met, he says, we've done studies, the 5% or the 15% will give you the same results. Uh, the key thing is uh, the first, it's still not like when I do remember that a, I forget how many milligrams of protein is required to produce one B. So, I don't have 10 frames of bees uh, in March. There might be two frames or one frame or two frames March, April. So an extra, say, five to 10,000 bees 
to help build that really first big nest. So we're not talking massive number of bees early on. So, and understanding that there's June pollen still, because they'll consume most of that sugar syrup honey. And now they're actually in the honey and the, the pollen stores left over from the previous season. Yeah. Uh, so the pollen patty is the trigger. It gives them that surplus. So I think it fools the bees in thinking now I have a surplus. Uh, I have some mm. extras and it triggers them because now there's a source because their trigger is until there's a natural source out there, they won't really start brood rearing up here unless there's something natural out there. So what I'm doing is I'm pretending I'm giving in that here's some pollen or that the pollen patties uh, and it triggers them. And literally these are one pound patties. Uh, in a bump last year, I had a colony with like 20 frames of bees coming out. It was a massive colony. And that one needed three pounds over a month and a half. So it's not massive numbers of pollen patty. Uh, and a typical one will be one to a half. So probably a half pound to a pound. We'll get it through March into April. Uh, it may get a second one, but then the natural pollen starts and then they stop taking it. That, that's interesting. What, what you just described is, is pretty much exactly what I do in the spring. I will feed copious amounts. You know, if, if there's a, a, a lack of pollen in a particular colony, but most of the time I, I'm looking at like a two to three kilograms of, of, um, of pollen in a colony. I like seeing them put that up the year prior in bee bread. And okay. that, and, and that way when spring comes, I'm not, concerned too much with feeding unless you know the weather throws things awry so anyway thank you for your answers just wonderful presentation good i'm happy you liked it thank you okay we got another one back here uh, how, how do you store your pollen patties and how long can you store them for uh in the freezer in a ziploc bag so i'll to make it easy i usually take my i buy a a 40 pound box every year. That's all I need. Uh, it cost me 200 bucks, but it's good for 10 colonies. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll wrap them in twos. Cause usually there's at least two colonies per yard in saran wrap and then stick them in big ziplocks and you can keep them indefinitely if you keep them away from freezer burn. So at least a year or two is fine. I have some that I've had in the freezer for, the, for a while and I'm still using them, but they're, they're pretty much just kept the exact same way as you explained it. So I feel better now. Yeah, no, it should be fine. But thank you. Okay, well, we're coming on nine o'clock. So thank you, Etienne, for sticking with us here. No worries, no worries. And like I said, I've got, uh, I'll send you the uh, where does moisture come from presentation. Thank you. And please share it around. That's, that's fine. Okay, I appreciate that. No so worries. now Dan, who, who's on here, he, he helps our club out a lot, even though he doesn't live here in Columbia County. And um, he's got, a, I'm jealous of him because he's got a, like a couple more weeks of a growing season than we do where he is. But um, Dan, you just said that you ha actually have some sensors in your hives. Is he still on with us? Yeah, yeah Dan, you're still there. I'm trying to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> what were you asking about? Do you have sensors on your hive? I don't have sensors on my hives. Ah. I oh. was getting, I, I was giving, giving some away to people this last year, but I don't like electronics in my hives. So, okay. I know that one of our club members actually has um, the the hive IQ sensors. So I'll have to talk to her about getting some of the data off of uh, off of that and see what we can do with that data. So um, thank you, Etienne, for letting us know what what are some of the things that we can do with that data and we just have to do it. So um, anybody else have anything to say? Just the last thing on that sensor. All you need is one and you do it in a colony that you don't really do anything with and you just let it go through the natural cycle. Make sure it's healthy, it's got everything. And what it'll do, it'll give you the, the bee, the annual cycle. 
it'll give you when she's laying, when she drops, and you keep it for basically a year and a half in there. And all you need is one or two in your brood box. And what it'll do is it'll give you your annual bee cycle based on that area. And then you can start seeing where the gaps are because you'll see that queen lay or stop laying. And that queen laying is our job, is we need lots of bees to have honey. And the more bees you have, the more chance you can get that, uh, that first flow you talked about is if the more high bees you'll have, the bigger your maple flow will be in most cases. Oh, I guess they froze. You can still hear me, Steve? Oh, yes. Okay. So I guess the other folks seem to have frozen out. So we'll, uh, I'm the host now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess I'll stop the recording here and then she can. Uh... Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for um, uh, encouraging people to do my class fatigue. I, I've got both compound and dissecting scopes and I've learned to do um, nosema and pollen analysis also. And I think it's just absolutely fascinating. So um, uh, I, I think he could do an online course on that to encourage other beekeepers. I think it'd be a great thing to do. Because it gives you another dimension to look at it. So oh, it's, oh, it's incredible. It, it, it's, it's fascinating. What's fun is once you learn to do pollen analysis, you can take honey samples and you can start looking at them and, 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 uh, and kind of verifying where they came from. Um, if you know enough about the pollen grain. Um, oh, exactly. Quality, so. exactly. Yeah. And th that's why I know what my bees are eating right now. Oh, oh yeah. Is because I know my pollen from beginning of the season to end of the season. Cause I've mapped it all out and I've got yeah. pictures of it, each one. So. Uh, well, and the other thing, um, we've got a couple people in the nation. Now we have one of Dr. Segili's, uh, Ramesh Segili's, uh, grad students, post-grad students, uh, um, uh, uh, Priya Chakrabarti. She's down at, in Mississippi now heading her own lab, um, as an assistant professor or associate professor. And she's doing nutritional analysis on pollen. And we mm. started gathering samples for her here in Oregon. And she's actually mapping out amino acids and micronutrients. Nice. on different pollen and plants so um, i'm sure you've got some really interesting plants out there that she would be you know if you can get uh, uh pollen samples and freeze them and send them to her i mean they'll pay for it to to get these samples they're still gathering um data on them but okay. they're trying to develop a, a whole uh database on on uh, nutritional analysis of pollen yep. um which will change a lot of things so yeah, no, and it should give a nice clearer picture of those true deficiencies versus just what looks like a deficiency. It is, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Sometimes they seem to be bringing tons of stuff in, but they're just not getting the nutrition they need. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, oh. Anything, oh, yeah, anything you can you can point at Linda. Um, I'm going to send you my content information. Um, just what you went through in, in like teaching high, like high school level microscopy and, and pollen analysis. So we'd love to do some classes down here. And I mean, there's geeks among, among us. Oregon um, uh, started what's called a, the Oregon Bee Project about five years ago. And we mapped all the, we've gone out and with so the citizen, citizen scientist army, we have been surveying the native pollinators in the state. And we've, we've developed a huge database and we've been able to do plant bee um, uh, uh, connections that, that didn't exist before with this database. Yep. So, so we've got a, we've got a, a bunch of very, very geeky people here in Oregon that uh, could, could, I think, benefit from a lot of this. So I'd be very interested in seeing that. Cool. Okay. But, uh, yeah, send me an email and uh, let's stay in touch. I will. I will. Thank you again very much. For sure. Cheers. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.